Welcome, one and all, to another Plymouthy podcast. And here today, I'm joined by my friend, the eco linguist Norbert Vyashbitsky. How you doing today? Thank you. I'm doing great, and uh, your uh, pronunciation of my name is spot on. So, oh, well, thank you for that. <laughs> I practiced uh, since I don't know Polish, but I do really like uh, like Polish a lot. Uh, I actually noticed when uh, you were just just came in, coming from your own show over in the Eco Linguist. By the way, everybody subscribe if you're not subscribed. We'll get that link up here in a second. That when you were speaking Polish, how little I understood. But uh, when the the others were speaking in Russian, I was like, oh, now I can understand. Which is funny because um, there's so many aspects about Polish phonetically, which should be easier for me to understand since they're less complex. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've just happened to have studied uh, uh, Russian. So I, it's interesting that the distinction I would have expected myself to understand more, but I, I really don't. So what, uh, being a, a native um, speaker of Polish, uh, I don't remember um, how much you had studied other Slavic languages before starting your eco linguist program, but God, let's start there. What what kind of mutual yeah. comprehensibility discoveries have you found for yourself and for members of your audience? Yes. So so I haven't been studying any Slavic languages really. Maybe some Russian in primary school, but uh, you know, um, for a couple of years. So all I picked up was uh, uh, the Cyrillic alphabet. You know, so I'm able to kind of decipher Cyrillic Cyrillic alphabet uh, if I need to slowly. Uh, and other than that, not really. I haven't been uh, studying any Slavic languages, but I've been fascinated because whenever I would hear Czech, Slovak, Russian, even, you know, I it just sounded so familiar. So uh, because I was not ready to commit to studying any of those languages, I decided I, I want to try it in a different uh, format. So I came up with this mutual intelligibility uh, conversations. It started off with just conversations. So I would just invite uh, random people from the internet, speakers of those uh, Slavic languages, and we would just chit chat for you know some time hmm. uh, and see how far the conversation can go. And it surprisingly it it, it went really far. So uh, yeah. yeah, so that's how it started. Now th it's so interesting. Uh, that that's possible to begin with because native speakers of English, unless we hear a language like, say, Scots, which s some even Scots themselves don't even believe is a legitimate language, we don't really have the experience of hearing something that's familiar and somewhat comprehensible. You know, the best we might be able to do be something like Dutch or German, but they're, I think, quite a bit more separated than, say, Polish from Slovak or Czech, right? I did want to find out about it, so I made videos uh, featuring those languages. You know, we tested mutual intelligibility, or basically just intelligibility of Dutch to English speakers, right? Uh, or uh, uh, or Ger or Dutch to German speakers, and, and and you know, I started doing the uh, Germanic languages uh, mutual intelligibility challenges on my uh, show after doing the. Slavic languages and Romance languages for some time. Yeah. So, yeah. So we, we were doing those experiments because, uh, yeah, English speakers tend to, you know, complain that there, there is no language that they can understand easily. <laughs> but we've tested it and, you know, <laughs> uh, definitely <Or> Dutch. <laughs> uh, Frisian, Frisian, actually, uh, it's also Frisian. a very good, right. good example. We haven't covered that yet, but uh, I just some weeks ago, uh, me and Simon Roper we, we, uh, and, and two, uh, three other people recorded a video featuring North Frisian. So that's coming. Ooh, uh, that'll be good. So Love seeing through those Simon, videos, yeah. So through those videos, actually, you guys can just see for yourself if you can understand it or not, because my channel is more about that. You know, it's about providing that experience to people who might not have access to you know, Frisian speakers or um, speakers of other Slavic languages or Romance languages. You know, we take it for granted. People who just uh, are very, um, who people who tend to travel around the world, they're backpackers or, or they're just like very passionate about other cultures and their language learners. We take it for granted. You know, we think this is something uh, everybody can do or, or think about. But you know, most people 
they they don't think about it too too much and definitely they're not actively looking for this kind of experiences but mm. i provide those experiences for them in a the format of a video so they can just have that experience without committing to the idea of you know travel or, or learning another language that's great still experience it yeah international backpacking with, for introverts it's great <laughs> or for just those of us who can't get around to these places i don't know when i'm going to go to um Frisia, i'm saying that in jest but um but no that's exactly uh that's one of the most amazing things of course i've uh, been deeply flattered to be a guest on multiple times and i am ashamed to say it's been so long <laughs> two years already uh, since uh, i first appeared on your channel and you finally uh, are here, and that is entirely my fault, and, but I'm really glad at least we have you <laughs> to ask some questions today. If you have questions out there for Norbert, uh, go ahead and ask them, especially if you write them with a question mark, I may be able to, to notice them. But I have my own because, um, you know, I've, I've studied a few languages, but just the the amount of, like, pulling out samples of Nosa or Swahili or Nepalese, like, I, 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 it's amazing because I, I I think like, oh, yeah, I know about languages. But then I, I hear some of the stuff that you put on your shows. I'm like, I would never have been able to guess. You know, maybe I could study a little bit more. But what have you, like, I mean, learned? I mean, have you, do you have an ear now? Could you, if you were challenged in a similar way, could you pull those things out? What have I learned? Um, you know, I can't really give you any s s details, like, because I haven't really been actively studying those languages. Just through doing those exercises, my comprehension comprehension improved, especially with French. You know, like uh, I had some experience with Spanish, uh, obviously, uh, uh, but French was always just such a foreign language to me. I couldn't understand anything. And mm -hmm. through working on those videos, because I spent lots of time editing it, you know, copying and pasting uh, subtitles, but I had to like go through them. I've just picked up so much in terms of comprehension. Mm -hmm. So definitely the idea of the comprehensible input in language education, I think that's really uh, been confirmed for me through this experience. Were you trained in that? Or rather, did you go through school learning languages in something similar to comprehensible input? Or... Not really, no, 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 not, not really. So obviously this idea was popularized uh, through uh, YouTube polyglots, basically, and uh, people like Steve Kaufman, for example, um, who, who talk about this. Uh, so I didn't even know about that before I, I, I started learning languages, like before I started learning English and, and Hungarian. So. So, yeah, I wish I, I, I had known that, you know, that would, mm. would be helpful. Uh, but now just through exposure to so many languages, I think my comprehension improved. You know, mm. I can't really actively speak any of those languages. Or if you ask me, oh, what's this word for, what, what is a Czech word for this or that, you know, I won't be able to tell you. But when I start to uh, talking to a Czech person, you know, things just like, fall into places somehow and adding context to it you suddenly are able to have a conversation wow. uh, with a person and we did those experiments and you can watch those videos like full full, full conversation with a czech person on the slavic languages hub that's another channel that i started a few weeks ago a few months ago actually where we just stream and Slavic languages speakers can call in and we can have conversations or, or, or do language challenges. And, and that conversation f lasted like an hour. And for an hour, we were able to just like chit chat about life and. Um, That's amazing. And stuff. So, yeah, it's it's a unique experience for sure. You know, it's not I don't think it's for everybody. Not everybody's able to, you know, watch it for one hour uh, straight, but. Uh, there are people who do, <laughs> you know, so they're mm. the, the, the core of this, this community that I'm creating on, uh, on YouTube. That's amazing. Well, uh, so before, so I understand that, that Czech is one of the closest languages to Polish. And, but before, if you heard Czech, would you be able to understand very much or did it take the repeated action of being in a conversation with a Czech speaker to get there? And if so, how long did that take? 
Uh, any Polish speaker that goes to the Czech Republic, you know, or Slovakia for that matter, like is able to get through like a simple conversation, no problem. You mm. know, wow. uh, th there might be some, some awkward situations sometimes or some funny situations because you misunderstand understand some things, you know, when they're asking you for your ID in the supermarket, you think that you they're asking you for uh, additional payments because it just sounds like really? very similar. What yeah. are the terms? Like doklat, I think it's, uh, which which sounds like a, um, like a top up or something. Uh, and you think that you have to like pay more money, hmm. but it's actually, it actually means ID, like show me your documentation or something. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, th there is obviously some etymological background to it. Like it come, like you can hear some after you 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 know what it means. You see, oh, so they just interpreted those uh, Slavic uh, roots uh, root words differently in this context, but it kind of makes sense. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. So you know. So in terms of like uh, details, I can't really tell you much. Uh, Maybe maybe one thing that comes to mind that I've noticed is that uh, because uh, I started with the Slavic languages uh, comparison, Slavic languages mutual intelligibility uh, videos, and then I moved on to the Romance languages uh, to do the same kind of thing. And what I've discovered is that uh, similar semantic shifts happened across languages in like across slavic languages and romance languages huh so let's say in some lang slavic languages the word feel to feel is interpreted as the word to hear right right so in like oh in in polish uh you could say swishish or chujesz chujesz like jak się chujesz like how are you feeling right and the Bulgarian person would understand it as like, how are you hearing? Like, can you hear me well? That's amazing. Like Italian from, say, Latin. Sentire means to feel in, uh, exactly. in Latin, but to hear in Italian. So I've noticed that happen. the this, this similar kind of shift ha uh, happens across languages, Romance languages. And I was like, mm. oh, obviously it's, it's not a coincidence because... It, we are talking about words related to senses, you know, so they're, you know, they all come from some basic feelings that we, we had, you know, and, and named and maybe hearing and feeling in some languages could be the same thing. I don't know. Uh, or in the past, you know, if, if we did uh, enough etymological studies, maybe we would find out uh more about it but uh, you know so that's 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 a kind of thing that i've noticed doing all those you know um the, the work with transcriptions and <laughs> captioning and stuff because i don't speak those languages i just notice things like uh, yeah you've been yeah. forced to as part of well your job to see so much text and combine it with sound and get all the timings right and that that's literally comprehensible input since you have the meaning and everything so Wow. So yeah, you just have you been able to test your new abilities uh, in in that way over the years? Have uh, either in the real world or certainly on the channel? Well, in Italy, because uh, I I go to Italy uh, every once in a while, and there I do try to use my Spanish skills to understand people and sometimes communicate with them using Spanish. You know, it's not it's not the it's not the most uh, um, sophisticated kind of conversation you, you can have, but you can get by. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Have you had the time to uh, pick up a new language since you started doing these comprehensibility experiments? Uh, not really, no. Mm -hmm. no, no Which one would you do now that you've seen most of them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which you know, you I still, I still want to like, focus on my spanish a little bit because uh, when i was living in mexico i had lots of exposure and actually that basically i i could say that that's how i learned spanish you know just through interacting with people and getting lots of exposure mm. just putting myself in situations when you know i was the only person that didn't speak spanish and i just had to sit there and listen to 
the people talk and uh, yeah, it was mentally exhausting because I was like, oh, I know what they're talking about and I might be able to say something, you know, but by the time I formulate a sentence in my mind, like they already moved on to a different topic. Right. But it's an exercise still, you know, it still happened. So now I can like watch um, a TV show in Spanish and I can like get the gist of it and it, it basically enjoy watching a show in Spanish. So you know, without really that much effort, like I didn't really put that much effort into learning Spanish, but it just happened to me. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so when you talk about uh, like picking up a new language and anything new you would want to study now, or are you no. so exhausted of all languages that you wouldn't, <laughs> this, is, in... this is, this that, is, that's the thing. Cause I just know how long it takes to get to a, a proficient level in, in a language. So it does scare me away a little bit to, to, to you know, from commit commitment to a particular language. Uh, so in theory, I'd like to learn another language, you know, and devote my time to it. But um, I, I think that, you know, now I live in Scotland and maybe I should be focusing more on, you know, learning the local slang and just, you know, f focusing on improving my English, you know because it's uh, it's a different thing when you when you settle in one particular place um yeah yeah it, it, there's so many words you know that i encounter here that i'm like oh wow like i've been you know speaking english for this long and and there's so many words to discover yet and and pronunciation practice and stuff there's so much to do with the languages that i already kind of uh, started hmm. that um I'm not ready to commit to a new language yet, but who knows, you know, this is, um, this is my like personal journey with languages. So also like on my channel, I'm not trying to present myself as I'm, you know, the, the language learner or expert on language, language learning, you know, I know things I, I can focus on some, some of it. But me myself, I have my, like my my personal journey with languages, and I'm don't want to like commit publicly. I'm going to learn this language, you know, and then people are going to keep me accountable <laughs> uh, and try to push for it. I'm like, you know, it's I don't want to stress myself out, you know, making commitments and like stuff like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> sure. uh, yeah. <laughs> Someone asked earlier. Um, how is your Hungarian? Are you still fluent? Or if um, you felt some some uh, regression in that, how are you able to maintain a, a foreign language at a high level? Yeah, so with my Hungarian, it's uh, uh, on the back burner for now. For now, So I, I think I have regressed quite a bit, but you know, I still have high level of comprehension because that's, you know, what happens with languages like comprehension uh, you start with uh, uh, higher comprehension than your uh, speaking skills you know and also when it starts regressing you also maintain your passive understanding for much longer uh, so I just you know enjoy listening to like Hungarian songs and, and stuff like mm -hmm. that but um, yeah it's uh one of the things that I'd like to go back and maybe refresh it, you know? Mm. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. Like if you have so many interests, you know, um, because, you know, linguistic from, from like a linguistic uh, curiosity point of view, I'm interested in learning Finnish and Estonian maybe, mm. or maybe Udmurt, you know, but because they're related to Hungarian and I already know it and it would be interesting to see how the, the same kind of principles, linguistic principles uh, manifest in other languages, you know, but it's not very practical for life, you know, so it's a very like just for like um, satisfying your curiosity in yeah, a way. I, I can see that. And um, Jermaine, to your uh, the end of your last live stream, someone asked if you would actually try to learn the uh, the Turkic languages from Evan. And uh, there's a lot of 
a potential uh, mutual intelligibility. And you were just talking about that with the last two guests you had on your channel, right? I think uh, he, uh, Ivan is asking about doing them on my channel, not actually learning them. Yes, uh, if that's what so I mean. Making uh, videos, uh, yeah. you know, with Turkic languages uh, and, and uh, yeah. just testing their mutual intelligibility. Yeah, so that's uh, uh, that's like a massive project to to take on again. So I, I feel that I'm at the moment I have Slavic languages, Germanic languages, and uh, Romance languages, and they are not finished yet. You know, there is still so much to do mm. on that uh, on the, um, uh, on that. So Turkic languages, they have to wait a little bit. I, I, I just said in my last stream that just before before getting on here that maybe we can do it live when people call in live and we can improvise because that's that's the main thing. You know, when, when you do this kind of shows, it takes a long time to organize a group of people that are available to, you know, meet and to do it uh, and do the recording and... Uh, then help with transcriptions and stuff. So that's that's the idea for my live uh, stream, regular uh, live stream show, where people can just call in and we can improvise, you know, because uh, maybe we're not going to turn it into a regular video, but it's still going to be fun and people who are, uh, are into it, they're going to appreciate it and love it. So it's not sure. about getting lots of views, it's about just reaching out to uh, a smaller community that is very interested in what we're doing. So live stream solves that problem of the uh, YouTube channel maintenance, like because you cannot just start suddenly uh, upload random content, you know, it has to make sense for your current audience. So live streams are the, the, they, they just followed a bit different rules and mm. we can do that. That's interesting. I, I hadn't thought about that. In fact, uh, someone was asking, I believe uh, Maurizio Capone was asking earlier about how you came up with the uh, the idea of your YouTube channels. I think you answer, answered that partially um, before. Did you say that you wanted to just engage in this practice? And yes. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so without committing to learning a language, you can still have experiences. You can still, you know, uh, um, get exposure to it and, and just also the, the, the idea of mutual intelligibility is just fascinating you know this, this whole mm -hmm. phenomenon and evolution of languages and you can study it from books of course but it's such a different experience when you just uh, uh, do it live with people you know you try to communicate and yeah that's what it's all about, you know, at the end of the day, just connection between humans. Mm. And and I, I know you explained to me once, that's what eco-linguist is supposed to mean, right? Um, in a way, yes, e eco, it, it, it creates an ecosystem, you know, eco stands for home in ecos, right, in Greek. Uh, Greek. Mm -hmm. So... It creates like a platform, a community for people interested in languages. Um, but ecolinguistics, it, it, it's a field uh, within linguistics that deals with relationship between language and environment. Mm. So that's kind of interesting as well, how the environment we kind of evolved affected the, the, the language that we speak. Right. Right. Yeah, now, some language. You, yeah. On the le individual level, or on, uh, or do you mean in the regional geographic level? Uh, geographic level, I suppose, but also just the uh, the immediate environment. Maybe there is, you know, the language that evolved on a desert is going to have a bit different concept different concepts than language that uh, evolved in in the jungles uh, you know hmm. um, yeah so, so that's the the ecolinguistics that study it they also like look into like how we perceive the environment through studying our language patterns like in different languages we we speak about 
nature environment differently, you know. So mm. they're trying to investigate those concepts as well. Uh, yeah. But you know, my channel is not covering that in in any way. So it's it's just a name. I, I just like that idea, and I thought that maybe my channel could become about you know video essays about linguistics and stuff like that. But it hasn't happened yet. It it turned into something else. It's more of a platform for the community to meet and um, have fun with languages and educate themselves and have linguistic uh, linguistics experience linguistic experiences you know yeah so it, it's you know it's not always what you intended uh like with youtube it's just sometimes it just takes you in a, into a different direction that is true <laughs> it certainly is well you hit the jackpot and you've um made such a contribution uh, i think through two ways uh one through just exposing people to languages they may never have heard or heard of even languages they might hear frequently, like varieties of Portuguese or Spanish uh, that are different, obviously, around the world, um, or dialects in Italy. And how is, there's stuff, you know, I love Italy and Italian, but there's stuff I've never heard in real life that I've heard on your channel. Mm -hmm. um, and a uh, question I had was, is, I'm, I'm kind of, I know it's anecdotal evidence, and it's not scientifically collected data, but um, when it comes to comprehensibility, since you've been able to run the experiments for the same languages, I'm wondering, is there, are there certain languages that, oh yeah, there's usually comprehensibility, maybe it's a linguistic or cultural thing, or is it, does it depend very much on the individual, their personality, their experience with other languages? Um, that's, that's what I wonder, like, because we like to say, oh, yeah, there's high mutual intelligibility between Czech and Polish. There's high intelligibility between Italian and Spanish. But how different or close is that in reality, since you've run the experiments in reality? Yes. So um, my videos, I don't think they could be considered uh, like pure experiments because the people that are in, the, in, in those videos, they're often you know, interested in languages, they have very diverse linguistic backgrounds, and sometimes they speak maybe two Slavic languages instead of one. So it's not always, um, it's, it's not always uh, kind of a valid data for any kind of linguistic research, you know. Um, so the way I approach that is that we're creating, we're making a video. It's a piece of content, you know, we put it online and every person that is going to watch it is going to filter it through their own linguistic background, you know? So it's very much focusing on the viewer, the person that is going to, to watch it. And we just try to create an experience for them. Hmm. So actually, whether the, the linguistic background of the people that are participating is not as relevant as, as important for what we're trying to make because it's not a scientific research. It's, it's a piece of content. It's an experience that we create for viewers. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so it could, I mean, this content could be potentially used in the, in the research, you know, maybe it could be played to people who were, specifically selected by researchers who who are monoglots and they speak only one language they only speak bulgarian or they only speak polish and and you know this is a kind of video that they're exposed to and they have to like uh tell what they understand do they know what's going on and and, and stuff like that maybe pot potentially hmm. um yeah some researchers contacted me um regarding those videos, but mostly they were asking, for example, about transcripts for those minority languages that you don't really have that much content mm. uh, online. So they needed that for their research. That's like great. The, 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 the Kashubian language episode, for example, uh, brought attention to some um, linguistic researcher who asked for the transcripts. Because it's, you know, a unique opportunity to have the transcript of a conversation, of a dialogue, of, of like a natural speech, not something written specifically 
for for the research or or a newspaper it's a different kind of language hmm. well that's fair but uh what about what about you do you feel now that you've done this for years for example one might assume that russian and bulgarian they have a lot in common because of a lot of words that come from old church slavonic that are in russian however russian's an east slavic uh language um so for example, I would, um, I've heard this, I don't know enough about Slavic languages, to, but this is a preconceived notion that I've heard that Bulgarian and Russian will have high, they're like highly connected. Some people even insist that Russian is a South Slavic language. Um, and I, I wonder, is that, uh, is that kind of idea founded because of the mutual vocabulary uh, that can exist between those two languages or is even russian and polish do those people tend to understand each one what do you i know it's just anecdotal but what do you feel mm, <laughs> you know I, when i look at my comment section you know there are people who say that they understand everything and there are people that say that they don't understand a word <laughs> so it's it's difficult to um to answer that question with a simple uh, answer, you know. Um, I think, but but more people are actually surprised at how much they can understand. That's for sure. I mean, the, the majority of comments are very like uh, positive, and people just express their 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 surprise how much they can understand. And actually, I think that that's why my videos actually blew up on YouTube. Because people understood, mm. uh, and they were surprised that they were able to understand that, you know, and uh, um, uh, and actually the videos of languages that are not so easy to understand, they have less views. You can actually see in the statistics, like, huh. oh, this this was a particularly difficult ch challenge, you know, and mm. not many people watched it. Or because the, the the people who clicked on it first, they they started watching it. They strugg struggled for too long, and they watched it for le uh, less amount of time. And YouTube doesn't recommend that video. I'll because... keep in mind if that, if I'm invited back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I went hard so... on the French speakers. I I don't know why I I, I just I it was. But in any oh, case, you, I... you you think that 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 could be the reason? That could well, be I, I I don't know. I haven't looked at the statistics uh, directly. But now that you mention it, I I did. That was not the easy Latin one that time, but uh, uh, but maybe maybe you see this is and so that's kind of uh, proves the point that actually more people understand it because if they didn't, they wouldn't watch the videos. And you can see when people drop off, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. so so from like the the the, the data point of view, like something. The actual data that I can share is is that you know my my YouTube statistics and and how people watch those videos and how comprehensibility affects uh, the success of a video. Right. Uh, you know, like like the Slovak Polish episode just blew up. I don't know. I think it has almost one million mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> one million views. But to me, you know, it was like embarrassingly easy. It was just like oh, it's gonna be like. It's it's basically like speaking the same language almost. It felt mm. like it, you know. So really? it's, it felt like a riddle for kids. <laughs> so so it was uh, uh, kind of funny, and that and it blew up because people were like, "Oh, this is the first time I hear Slovak, or this is the first time I hear uh, Polish as a Slovak person or Czech person." And, mm. And it sounds almost the same with slightly different pronunciation or using different uh, like synony like synonyms. You know, some words that are synonyms in Polish are common words in Slovak. You right. know, so uh, so that's kind of interesting how words um, that it's more about register. Like so, so, for example, for us, this is a colloquial term. But for Czech people, it's uh, an official word that they use, uh, or, or the words that they use. This they sound like children's speech for us. So it's kind of funny to mm -hmm. listen to like a, an official speech and they speak using those denominatives that we find very childish. 
and the, for them it's it's normal it's neutral hmm it's, it's amazing um flying j asks look we good can't do deutsch deutsch kann ich nicht gut aber deutsch kann ich ein bisschen verstehen und sprechen but i'm not very good at german I haven't there's a language i haven't similarly uh to you i haven't studied in many many years uh but uh i can throw out a couple phrases still mm -hmm, now and then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well um i've often had the question uh, to dissect what the difference is between dialect and language and since you've dealt with varieties of language that some consider to be dialects uh, for example but then you have Slovak and, and uh, Polish, which are so similar among other languages. And has that, has doing that changed your personal understanding of what these terms language and dialect mean? Definitely. <clears throat> well, I've learned that this is a very complex issue and people really care about this a lot, like whether they language has a status of a dialect of or a, a language um but it does you know come to the the legal aspects of it i suppose i like uh in poland for example we had the kashubian language you know it, it's been there forever but only recently it uh it's it's been recognized as an official language um a legit language and also like a, a, one of the languages uh, uh, of poland and it changed the perception of it hmm. dramatically you know because now you can pass your national exams in that language you can request that your you know exam in, exam to be in that language hmm. So people started seeing, perceiving it in a different way just because of the status. So it's a status thing for sure. Hmm. It has some legal um, consequences as well. You know, like the government has to translate things into that language to communicate with the community in their native language, for example. Hmm. So uh, that's one way of looking at it but like in italy for example you know you know most of it, uh, the italian uh, particip participants from italy in my in my videos they they don't really mind that much whether you call it a dialect or a language they always like oh in italy we call them dialettos but the word dialetto right in italian doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as dialect in english because it's with cultural like implications and right they just understand that mm. italy is like very diverse and you have this common language and you have like local dialects and lo minority languages and and they just function in a multi multilingual uh, uh society and you know it's just different way of looking at it from their perspective so it's always a matter of perspective how you look at it uh but obviously there probably are people who also want their languages to be recognized like there are initiatives for the venetian language or frulian language that want more recognition uh, for those languages in italy so there are also mm -hmm. people trying to um yeah get more recognition for their languages indeed well, the difference between uh, Friulian and some other dialects in the north, for example, so they 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 want and they seek to have a, a status, and I think they have some recognition. But I find it so interesting too because that it changes a lot when there is a recognized language. If you have to have exams in it, well, then there's going to be a standardized way to to write it, and then there can be grammars written in textbooks for example i've had a heck of a time trying to learn sardinian simply because it's been so hard to get a grammar or exercises or find the consistent you know version because they're the varieties the dialects of sardinian for example are so various uh they're not terribly various but it's you know 
the verb conjugations are different. So if they're different, then wait, which one do I learn and why? You know, I have to make those decisions. But if I learn Italian or if I learn Polish, there's a textbook version. And children in school learn, like yourself, you learned, even if you came from somewhere which might have some accent or dialect, you, you would be able to tell me, oh, well, the, nor the, uh, the standard version of Polish is this, but I, from this area, do this. But, but that doesn't exist with those uh, those dialects, and I and this is a this is sort of a more more broad uh, topic as, as when it comes to dialect and language and so forth. So I wonder. Well, I I think what your channel has helped to do is to change our conception. Those of us who have watched of language and dialect and think that okay, having an official status or not or, you know, dialect or whatever it is may, um, may not be so important because I think that turns people off. They think, oh, dialect, oh, I don't want dialect because dialect actually has a fairly, it's under, yeah, it's, it's used all over Italy, but it doesn't have a, it's a neutral to negative uh, sense most of the time. They'll say, oh yeah, I speak, I speak dialect at home and I, and they feel shame about that. Now I, I, I don't, can't speak for all Italians, but it, they, um, there's this, there's a sense of a prestige version of, of the Italian language, and they might not even realize that what they're speaking isn't just a bad Italian, as maybe decades ago it was normally considered, but is actually a, a language that evolved parallel to it, much like the Scots language evolved in parallel to, to English. And yet so many Scots are have been, I don't know about today, but they've uh, used to be taught that what they were speaking was bad English when it was just you know mm -hmm. something that evolves mm -hmm. separately and uh so i i don't I know how uh yes how i think that or is yeah, it resolution i mean uh, i think we just need to like chill uh, a little bit about it you know like it's people speak variety of different languages dialects vernaculars and it's fine you know we can all be mul multilingual and the fact that someone speaks like uh i don't know toscan at home or they speak uh uh abruzzese or neapolitan at home whatever it doesn't mean that they have to like stop speaking italian you know they can completely like have two different uh, languages and they learn english and they then, then they learn other languages and we, we can be multilingual you know so um, I don't think there is a need to, you know, demonize the dialects, you know, but also uh, it's okay to speak a uh, lingua franca, you know, because it helps the the communities to to find a common ground and mm. it's fine. Like we speak English right now, right? And it's, you know, a ling the global language right now. So mm -hmm. it's fine, you know, I can still use my Polish and I, I don't feel like I'm jeopardizing my Polish because I speak English, you know? Hmm. Right. Has, so. Have you observed a change in people's learning of their second foreign language? Um, uh, since, since uh, well, maybe let's say, let's say since you were a kid, uh, I'm asking because before say in Europe, people would want, Oh, no, I, I can't learn English. I have to take French instead. This is, would be long ago, many decades ago. But now I, I understand that pretty much everyone learns English. And so they get to choose then as an option some other foreign language. Instead of then choosing um, a very dominant European language like German with many millions of speakers, has that encouraged uh, Europeans to study um, less important, to, to put it that way, uh, languages? Um, there is definitely a movement, uh, among the younger generation right now that actually, if you, if you see lots of people in my videos that speak those dialects, whether it's like the, the, some Italian dialects or Arpitan or, or, uh, or Occitan, you know, those are young people, like young generation that just, you know, started their independent life. So whatever, you know, so they're very into it. They, they, they are into language revival. It, it's it's going strong. So it's not like it, we used to have this idea that those minority languages are spoken by older generation. But it's much more common these days. 
to see people speaking minority languages and they're, they're young and they pick it up maybe because they grew up in that area, but they ne were never taught that language and they feel like they missed out on something and they want to reconnect uh, with the community through learning that language and they, you know, compile resources and, you know, it's difficult, but they try to do it. And there is lots of support online because you can just join Discord groups that are dedicated to those uh, languages and find other geeks, language geeks, you know, people who want to contribute to uh, language revival, uh, you know. Hmm. So, yeah, there is lots of that. I think, yeah, yeah. I think the, the internet made Europeans more aware of those languages and also gave people tools to to make a good effort in language conservation and revival, I think. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you had a combination of um, uh, one, at least one um, pretty, uh, very universally recognized universal language among, among others, plus the internet. Now people can find each other so easily, which is remarkable. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's, it's tremendous. Well, um, among the Romance languages, um, who understands French best? Do you think? <clears throat> wow. <laughs> Speakers yeah. of Catalan, uh, uh, Castilian Spanish, uh, Portuguese, Galician, Italian, uh, or uh, even Romanian. Maybe Catalan speakers, maybe. Uh -huh. it's, it's a wild guess, but I think that would be the closest. Of course, Occitan speakers, but... Oh. They they are they are bilingual, so it's it's that it doesn't count, you know. Mm, that's right. Um, mm, yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure about Romansh because I think that Romansh speakers they are usually bilingual, but they speak German. I, I'm not sure now, but but yeah, I think Catalan possibly. But mm. obviously, Catalan speakers, they also speak Spanish. They tend to speak Spanish or uh, in Andorra, they also speak French. You know, that's the thing in Europe. You know, most people are bilingual or they're multilingual. This is something very natural, especially these days. Uh, yeah, maybe because languages are so similar... And there is always some sort of like the dominant language in your area that you have to learn. And then there are languages that you speak at home. I think it's it's always been like that, you know, just, just now people kind of are, are more aware of that. They're more conscientious about it. And they take, they make effort in, in language preservation and they also want to be recognized. You know, they don't want to feel ashamed that, or, or pushed down just because they, you know, didn't grow up speaking a posh variety of, of that language, you know. Mm. So yeah. I think it's, you know, language and identity has lots in common, like how people like formulate the way they identify. Mm. Yeah. What, what about um, polyglots or who does that? Do you think polyglots have a different kind of identity or do they uh, do they uh, grow up changing their identity a little bit i can speak for myself and you can as well being that we speak more than one language fluently um i, I mm -hmm. can only imagine uh that someone who is a monoglot would tend to associate or identify more easily certainly with their their country uh or their people of origin but uh, does do you think learning a language really not, not only does it aid in learning languages, but it does it possibly opens people up in your experience? Mm, in general, yes. I think it tends to open people up a little bit and give them a wider perspective on things. That, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the polyglots, it's, a, it's an extreme case, you know, because most people tend to just learn maybe one more language. You know, they, they have their native language and then maybe they pick up another language. 
it's usually English, you know, as a lingua, a global lingua franca. Um, but people who start picking up more and more languages, yeah, they are, they have some personality traits that are unique to them for sure. What are you those know? polyglot personality traits? Uh, I, I, no I suppose they are a little bit more open-minded. They they kind of um, they they want to learn about other cultures and to kind of understand them. They have to get out of their comfort zones, mm. and they have to like challenge the 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 ideas that they grew up with. Mm. Like oh, actually, there are people who look at this in, in a different way, you know. So maybe polyglots are more likely to you know, to discuss things and um, find a nuance everywhere. Hmm. You know, that's probably that that's probably the, the, the biggest trait I, 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 that comes to mind right now. It's hmm. interesting. What um, do you think? It's, it's a chicken and the egg question, I suppose. Do you think it's the person becomes a polyglot Prime, because they already have the, those traits for whatever reason, uh, whether environment or or hereditary or whatever, or does they have the learning of the multiple language create that environment to become more open minded? Mm, uh, again, like so, could you rephrase that? Maybe yeah. Cause... Well, it, like um, if if someone, uh, I suppose my question is. Poly, let's say polyglots tend to be more um, not open-minded is too too limited a way to describe it. More, um, I don't know, maybe xenophilic. Like they're interested in other languages and cultures. They're not fixed in a national I identity exclusively. You know, maybe they they have um, they sure they can still be be patriots to their country and all all that. But they might you know really appreciate more. Um, foreign things. And I wonder, is that because they were like that and then wanted to learn about the other, to learn the other languages? Or did they learn the languages and then they got like that? Yes, that's definitely a, an egg and a, a hen kind of question. What about you? Um, I think I really wanted to learn languages. Like I wanted to know what's out there. Yeah, so like I really wanted to learn English. I really wanted to get it to high level so I could study ab abroad. So I had that inclination since uh, I was a child. Mm. But I was exposed to television, so you know it's hard to tell because I saw those, you know, other countries. You know, uh, I knew that it existed and it was like interesting. So, so, so it's not only the language, mm -hmm. but I kind of also knew that they spoke a different language because you could kind of, in Polish, we have this uh, television uh, uh, would play like a movie and you could hear like some a foreign language in the background. And then you have a reader that reads it with like a monotonous voice mm -hmm. in Polish. I've seen those. Translating <laughs> that to you. Uh, so you kind of knew, oh, there is a, it's a different language there, you know, like, it, it sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but it, actually, it's, it's kind of funny, because once you uh, get used to that voice, that monotonous voice reading it, like, you forget that it exists, like, you just focus on the movie. I imagine. Yeah, I remember when I started watching dubbed things in Italian, how unsettling it was it was because i i uh which especially if it were a show that i recognized or actors or something mm -hmm. i found it uh, uh, terribly unpleasant but mm -hmm. i i i tried my hardest to put my my because i that caught that um unpleasant experience uh of seeing things dubbed and actors speaking and it's and i love their the, you know, the voice actors but it's like but that's not their voice their lips aren't matching perfectly. It was really weird. I but I so that created a prejudice in me. I tried to put it aside, and I watched a lot of things uh, dubbed in Italian over time. And then I mm -hmm. found I just like you were saying it. Any hint of the negative association or the oh what a nice coffee mug. I'm very flattered. 
I'm delighted. Available also in Europe, guys. So if you're in <laughs> Europe, you can order that online. That's so lovely. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I just it all it all went aside, and uh, I found that now that like I've been watching Star Trek all of it with my girlfriend, and now I have just as much positive association or nearly as much with the the voice actors and in Italian as I did in English. And now I have the benefit, since I love Italian, that I'm learning a lot of Italian vocabulary, which is why a while back I made that video saying, hey, use this. And I, when I made the video, I tried to find clips in other languages. And then I discovered, oh, Polish does that. They do they lower the audio of the voice and then they have the mm -hmm. mon monotonous voice. <laughs> but yeah. I imagine one could get used to that too. But, you know, when you grow up with it, with it you, you just don't notice that, uh, that voice. But after you've learned that language, you know, like I'm not able to watch anything with the reader anymore. Like I'm like, it's very disturbing, <laughs> especially if you understand the language that, you know, like English, like in, behind it and you can tell that they're not translating it well. Uh, it, they just, because sometimes they just need to shorten the phrase or like, you know, because there's a limited time that, you know, that the reading can, can, it, it can happen because the scene progresses very fast and what whatnot. So no, I can't watch that anymore. But dubbing is a it's a different thing, and actually it's becoming more popular in Poland uh, now. Yeah. yeah, there's the like some some like Marvel movies have been dubbed, and actually it's been very popular. So hmm. they're gonna keep doing this. <laughs> so a full uh, audio voice replacements, like in Italy or France. Yeah, like every character has their own voice actor that reads their parts. So. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, it would be a, that's a great benefit to those of us who would want to learn Polish because then we can we can watch uh, I don't know the Avengers and then we we which we maybe we've seen it a lot of times and we know it well and then we can uh, we can enjoy that uh, that experience and learn new vocabulary, especially when dubbing. And I've noticed this too. Sometimes they'll do especially good jobs at localizing terminology, vocabulary, jokes. Those are so hard to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're... Really yeah, I mean, some people would say that it's better to watch original content, you know, but I think, like, originally, content created originally in the language that you're learning because mm -hmm. you're also picking up uh, some things about culture. And But I think that you really want to watch something that you enjoy watching. So, and also if you're familiar with some movies, like like, like maybe the Star Trek show, you want to rewatch it in the language that you're learning. That's perfect because you already know the story. So you're not really that, you know, you don't feel like you're missing out on something. You're just like enjoying the language itself, like, yeah. and just admiring how they did it and the, the way they translated it and how it flows. Yeah. So actually, it's good to watch something that you're already familiar with, even if it's just a, a TV show, American TV show with Polish dubbing or Italian dubbing. It's worth watching it. Yeah. And uh, especially for, for Spanish, the Star Trek has uh, different dubbings for different regions of the world. So there is That's like right. Latin American Spanish and Spanish from Spain. And recently, I just dub just, just checked because... I actually watched some shows in Spanish uh, with Spanish dubbing just to practice my uh, Spanish comprehension. And it was so funny because uh, Spanish uh, uh, from Spain, Castellano version of Janeway. I mean, her. I don't know if you've heard you've, her. You've been watch, watching Voyager? I've, I've been watching Voyager too lately in Italian. <laughs> yeah, so so if you try if if you switch to uh, Spanish from Spain, like her voice is just amazing. She, it feels like she's been smoking all her life. Oh, you oh you like the uh, and a more. Uh... <laughs> I mean, it's it's we it's kind of bizarre because this is not how the actress sounds in her real life. So it's like such a dissonance, you know, like cognitive dissonance. Like wow. Uh, like how how could you do that? But it makes sense, you know. If you if you start watching it uh, without knowing how the the real actors sound, you get used to it because we get used to all kinds of voices. You know, we kind of evolve to do that. Like 
some people say, oh, your voice is so bad or whatever. Like you, you should never have a podcast, you know, because your voice is so, so, so ugly. It's not true. It's very distinguishable. And actually, if you talk a sense, if you talk about something that people want to learn about, they're going to listen to you. They're not going to mind your voice. So even if you consider your voice sounding ugly, just but you have some interesting things to say about something that you're passionate about, just go for it. You know, Agreed. it's going to be your like, like signature, you know, uh, voice, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, uh, what's that actor? Um, uh, Stellan Skarsgård, the, uh, he, he, uh, ha- he has a very gravelly voice he, and, but, uh, he's, and of course he's a great actor, which helps, but, and that's why he's a great actor. So he has, of course, that distinct voice. So it's great for his characters, uh, that, that he can play. So. That's a good, really good advice to everybody. Don't be ashamed of your voice. It's yours. It's all yours. Absolutely. No one else can yes. imitate it. Yes. Um, and, uh, well, the, yeah, I've been watching uh, uh, Voyager 2. I've noticed that, like you were saying, you know, it's better to have things in the original content to learn more about the culture. And what I really like, too, is that since they're in front of a microphone mm-hmm. and they try to make it sometimes sound like it's in the environment, but it's normally clearer than the original or what would be if it were original Italian content. The thing that I find most um, difficult to get used to is that they're speaking Italian, but they're just not gesticulating enough. They don't have enough body language. Mm. They don't have Italian and other just besides their hands. There's certain Italian body language things that when they say things I can, I can like, I see Janeway. She's like that, but I hear the voice actress doing this. You know, she's doing something really emphatic. She probably and... was doing that. <laughs> yes, yeah, <while recording. laughs> I guarantee it. Um, so it's uh, so I find that a little jarring, but you know, that's that's uh, more. Than it's not going nice. to be perfect. Yeah, it's not going to be perfect, but it's it's fun. Uh, the biggest problem that language, you know, geeks and language learners are facing right now is lack of uh, captioning that actually represents what people say on the screen, you know? Mm, really? Uh, yeah, I think even like if you change the, the the language to Italian or something and then you put on Italian captions, they're not going to match what oh, is right. being said. Oh, right, exactly. That, you're right, that's a huge problem um, because the subtitles are translated from the English and the dubbing is modified to fit the lips uh, and the timing better. So... Usually the um, the information is more accurate to the original in the subtitles, but it's not going to be what you're hearing. So it's it's I find it way too distracting. I can only do one. It's or distracting. The other yeah, exactly. That that's the problem. Uh, but yeah. obviously they did captioning like for different purpose. They don't expect people to watch Italian uh, dubbed TV show and and uh, read subtitles. Right. You know. Exactly. Stubbed for yeah. native speakers, not for people learning the language, which is a shame, yeah. but it's an understandable one. Hmm. Yeah. And if there are like people hard of hearing, they can just have subtitles and, you know, they don't mind that there is some dis- discrepancy between the, the, the speech and the voice. But if you're learning a language, you really want to know, you know, what they're saying. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, to, to wrap up, um, this is maybe too big, big of a question, or it's certainly an unanswerable one, but I wanted to, to throw, throw one at you. What are the limits? How, how far does this comprehensibility go? Can um, an East Slavic language speaker understand West Romance? And uh, how, how, how far do you think it can go? And is that dependent on certain environmental circumstances? Um, you mean uh, if we w- are able to make um, an Indo-European mutual intelligibility yeah. kind of video, for example, that that would be fascinating. I think there there it could be possible, but it it couldn't be spontaneous. You know, like 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 we we tend to do it spontaneously, just you know. We have a framework to to focus on, and that's it. And it, things ha- are happening, and then we record that. But with that experiment, that, that that kind of experience, we would have to do lots of research and maybe formulate sentences, uh, 
you know, we would have to put more effort into it, you know, just find the, those core words that mm -hmm. everybody could understand and maybe artificially create a sentence that everybody can uh, get the gist of. Hmm. Yeah, so that's that's a bit different uh, different concept, but it would also be interesting to just maybe play this this uh, broken telephone kind of thing mm. game, where we start with a message in one language and try to filter it through multiple different languages through throughout the in in the European spectrum, and end up somewhere in I don't know India, mm, and see. Uh, how message uh, has been transformed but that would also require us to like choose the right speakers for it hmm. to to create this continuum and pass the message through so multiple speakers of of different languages yeah and, and if they're monoglots or polyglots it's <laughs> difficult and jackson crawford showed up hey jackson and was notes that uh, andrew burr at the university of kentucky has taught proto-european as a conversational language conversational that, language yeah he has mm -hmm. if you go to jackson's uh um uh, channel you'll see that and you'll see jackson learning a number of languages lately like icelandic and estonian uh good on and him and finish <laughs> and finish yes. well i guess now i was gonna make a terrible pun and it hurts me inside to say it when you, you get that far no north that's as far as you can go you're finished, finished learning languages mm -hmm. yep okay mm -hmm. and so <laughs> uh john doe asks if uh what do you think about the impediment of uh scripts a uh, foreign scripts is how much of that impedes one's desire or ability to learn a language do you think mm, it's it's definitely a factor, you know, uh, even when you want to pick up a Slavic language and you need to learn the Cyrillic alphabet, you know, it's not that difficult, but it's definitely a barrier that you, you need to consider. Like, hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it just like, it's much easier just to jump into learning Czech because you don't have to learn any, any particular uh, alphabet, you know, so you're halfway there just... You know, you're, you're better off at the starting point. And I, um, I, I would normally agree too. I've on, the only time I've definitely felt the opposite is the very limited time I've spent on Polish. How uh, well, for example, the Polish orthography, <clears throat> the Lat, the Lat, use the Latin alphabet, but use it very creatively. By which I mean in ways that I'm not used to, and I'm used to the only other Slavic language I know anything about at a mm. more than completely superficial level is Russian. And there's a, there, although the phonology is still very complex, even we, with those uh, 33 letters, it's just not what I expect. And, uh, and so I, I can, that's the only time I, I would ever have, have said that it's, uh, it's easier that way. But no, really every other alphabet that's different than the one you know really well presents a lot of challenges. Well, yeah, I, actually there was the, the Udmurt language is written in Cyrillic. And it is a Ugro Finnish language. So for a while, I was like interested, like I just want to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, and the Cyrillic alphabet kind of put me off of it a little bit because, because you know, it's so much diff more difficult to notice the, the etymological uh, re relationships between like Udmurt language and Hungarian language if you don't see those words written in the same alphabet. So you have to transcribe it them first and then you will see Unless you're like a genius, you know, and you can process this information really fast, then then um, that might help. But but generally speaking, I think it it is it is a factor, you know, the alphabet of the languages is a factor. But if you really want to learn it, I think you know your motivation is going to be strong enough to overcome it. It's not. You know, if you're learning languages casually, then yeah, that could be a big factor. But if you are really committed to le learning the language properly, then it's it's a fun thing to learn. You know, a new alphabet. I agree. Well, we'll finish up there for today, Norbert. Thanks so much for uh, being on the channel. Really appreciate it. Thank thanks you for so much having for me. What you're doing for all of your your subscribers and watchers who have learned so much from the Ecolinguist channel. Thank you so much. All right. See you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.